Good morning, Dr. Todd Williams joining you here on Facebook, or if you see this through replay or YouTube, I'm talking to you about seven important decisions for life's journey today. Seven important decisions for life's journey. I'm going to be looking at the scripture first of all in the Bible. I'm going to be looking at Isaiah chapter 48 this morning. Now I want to start out by saying a few things to you about the context of Isaiah 48 is that we all face difficulties. We all face trials. We all face circumstances that are adverse or may even at times be in a place where we don't want to be. Uh, we may not like what's going on around us. We may feel like we want things to change. And if I could change them, I would. But many times we find ourselves in a place where no matter what decision I made, it may not change the circumstance, all right? But I want you to see something out of Isaiah 48 this morning. Verse 10, verse 10, God tells his people, he says, Behold, I have refined you, but not with silver. I have chosen you in the furnace of affliction. I have chosen you in the furnace of affliction. It doesn't say that he, his, he chose them after they went through the furnace of affliction. He chooses while you're in an adverse time, in an adverse moment. I believe some of that choosing happens by the choices that we make. Difficult times have a way of changing our decisions about life. Things that we wouldn't have previously chosen, as I've heard is said before, what you call a crisis, God calls a classroom. Remember, I used to hear Dr. Kreitz say that. What you call a crisis, God calls a classroom. And does that mean that God is trying to teach us something? Well, sometimes, yes. Does that mean that God has put this thing on us or caused us to go through something? Well, he doesn't say that. He just simply says, I have chosen you in the furnace of affliction. Many times we fight adversity. Many times we are fighting or wrestling against where we are uncomfortable, I'll say. Sometimes I can believe that we become too comfortable. I'll move on from here. God says in verse 11, I've done this for my own sake. And it's for my sake I will do it. How should my name be polluted? And I will not give my glory unto another. He says, Hearken unto me, Jacob and Israel, my called. I am he. I'm the first and the last. My hand has also laid the foundations of the earth, and my right hand has spanned the heavens. When I called, they stand together. God's reminding you of who he is and who you are. Verse 14, he says, All of you, assemble yourselves and hear. Which among them has declared these things? The Lord has loved him, and he will do his pleasure on Babylon, and his arm shall be on the Chaldeans. Verse 15, God says, I, even I, I have spoken. Yes, I have called him. I have brought him, and he shall make his way prosperous. I have this underlined in my Bible because I have discovered that anything that God calls you to his intention is for you to prosper in that thing. That doesn't mean that we don't have times of struggle, but ultimately God has a plan to prosper you. I believe that. I don't believe that God has a, a plan to impoverish me. I believe that God has a plan to prosper me. Else he wouldn't say in his word, I take pleasure in, in the prosperity of my servant. I'm moving on from here. Verse 16. He says, Come near unto me, and hear me, 
And hear this. I have not spoken in secret from the beginning. From the time that it was, there I am. Or there am I. Now, the Lord God and his spirit has sent me. Pay particular attention to verse 17. Thus says the Lord, your Redeemer, the Holy One of Israel. Good morning, Jingo. I am the Lord your God, which does what? Teaches you to profit. I am the Lord your God, which teaches you to profit, which leads you by the way that you should go. There is a way in which you should go. God will lead you by that way. Going on to verse 18. Oh, that you had hearkened to my commandments, then your peace would have been like a what? A river. And your righteousness... Many times I just say it as rightness, as the waves of the sea. You see, also it had been as the sand and the offspring of your bowels as the, the gravel thereof. His name should not have been cut off nor destroyed from before me. He says to them, go forth from Babylon and flee from the Chaldeans, the voice of singing declare and tell this. Don't miss where he just said with the voice of singing. Tell this, utter it even to the ends of the earth. Say, the Lord has redeemed his servant Jacob. Verse 21. And they thirsted not when he led them through the desert. They thirsted not when he led them through the desert. He caused the waters to flow out of a rock for them. I ain't ever seen much water coming out of a rock. But God can cause water to come out of a rock for you. He claved the rock also, and the waters gushed out. The Bible didn't say the water was coming out of the ground. They said it was coming out of a rock. There's no peace, says the Lord, unto the wicked. What am I talking to you about this morning? I'm talking to you about some decisions. You can take one of these and pass it around. You'll need a pen if you're joining me this morning or if you're watching this by replay. Get yourself a pen, a pencil, and jot a couple of things down for yourself. A piece of paper. You see on the top of your sheet, when you get it, it says seven important decisions for life's journey. And up underneath it, it I've got written seven things that I've determined I need for my journey here. And I'll give everybody just a second to, to get that and get your pen handy and something you can write, right? And I want to talk to you about a couple of things right here. Everybody got, you got your paper? Thank you, Joy. All right, everybody, fix your eyes on me just here for a second. This is a conversation that, that I am in with the Lord and have been this week. And this is the reason that I'm talking to you about this. I want to talk to you about simplifying your life. Say that with me, simplifying my life. my life. Glory to God. And the reason I'm talking to you about this is because I believe in, in simplifying your life with a perspective of what is needful to your life. And from this moment forward to the day you took your last breath, if you got to choose seven things that you felt would be needful for the rest of your life, what would they be? Now everybody can fill in different blanks there. You got to choose seven. I just limited it. 
The first one that I put down, I'm going to give you all P's here. You can adopt mine or you can, you know, you can uh, create your own list at some point. Because I believe visions can be either birthed or borrowed. But this is my vision. Number one is people. People. And I'm talking about people that are needful in my life. I'm not just talking about everybody when I say people. I'm not talking about all the 8 billion people on the planet. I'm talking to you about Right people. This is part of my perspective of simplifying my life, is having the right people in my life. People that I can share life with and people that I can share love with. It's very important of who you know. A lot of people think that an education will get them where they want to be in life. It will to some degrees. I will tell you that. I'm not an uneducated person. My pursuit every day is to educate myself. But I have found in many capacities that what you know can only take you so far. And what you know is determined by who you know. Many of the things that I am missing is because there's a missing relationship or a missing conversation. People are important to your journey here. If God would have wanted you to live this life all alone on an island, he would have put you there. Now you could make the decision to go by your own island. It's probably going to be expensive. So I hope you've got plenty of capital. But most people don't fare well by themselves. Even God said, it was not good for man to be alone. God didn't try to fix that problem with Adam, with himself. Of all the things that God created, and God said it was good, everything he said was good, he said, it is not good that man be alone. So I can determine from scripture that I need people in my journey through life. There are people that are going to need me, and there are people that I'm going to need. Two reasons for that. I'll talk about it later, but I'll go ahead and tell you now, is because I have a purpose that people need, and other people have a purpose that I need. So this makes us interdependent upon one another. I know many times in America we don't like to to hear this because we are very individualistic. But you need people. The most important person you need is God. He's the, he's the most important person. You need a daily relationship with the Holy Spirit. A daily conversation with Him. You want to call that prayer? I'd rather call it conversation because most people have adapted prayer is just talking to God about what you need. I prefer conversation and the greater part of that is me listening and me being quiet and listening to what he has to say. I'm contemplating many of the things of what do I need for life from this point forward from where I am. I'll be 50 years old in a month. What do I need the rest of my life here, God? I'm contemplating my journey. I'm simplifying my life. The second thing that I've determined that I need is peace. That's number two on my sheet. I need peace. I'm not telling you that I don't have peace. I have peace. 
but I need peace. And peace is something that has to be maintained. It's not something that you capture once and are able to keep. Peace is something that has to be kept. Something that has to be maintained. It's like your automobile. You could have bought it brand new, but if you never change the oil in it, eventually it's going to have a catastrophic breakdown. Peace is something that has to be maintained. It has to be maintained in your mind. It has to be maintained in your heart. I believe having right people in your life plays a vast majority with how much peace you live in. I need peace. You know why I need peace in life? I need peace so that I can make proper decisions. Bad decisions are always made where there is no peace. Bad decisions are made where there's fear. Bad decisions are made where there's worry. Bad decisions are made when there's anxiety. Many people, they don't know what it's like to have calm in their mind or calm in their heart or even have peace in their heart. They don't know what it's like to have a peaceful atmosphere. Some people have become so adapted to having stress or uh, strife in relationships that they have no idea what it's like to have peace between people. There's always some constant commotion or drama or fighting or something going on. I'm talking to you about people and peace. Because the people you choose to be in your life are going to determine many times the level of peace that you're experiencing. I'm just telling you. So choose wisely. Contemplate who you let have access to you and how much they have access to you. There may be some people that you have to pursue, some people that you have to draw near to. And then there may be some people that you need to close the door on, start a new chapter in life, move on from. Not everybody can go into your future with you, so stop trying to drag people that are dead weight into where you need to go. And I'm talking to you ultimately more about the peace of God. I want you to think about some verses of scripture of what God has promised and if you're not experiencing peace, then I will tell you that you're not living within the parameters of the promises of God. What does he say? Isaiah 26, verse 3, he says, I will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed upon thee. Well, Todd, you don't understand. I have other things to think about. So do I. I can't read my Bible all day, Tom. Neither can I. Well, I can't pray four hours a day. Well, neither can I. I have things to do. I have responsibilities. But the Bible does tell me that if I keep, if I keep my mind on God, I'll be kept in peace. There are moments when I may have to drive somewhere. I may be in the car for an hour or two. I make a choice, especially when I'm alone. I have a Bible app on my phone. I just listen to the Bible while I'm driving. I take opportunities I said, I take opportunities. You have to make choices to make opportunities and you have to schedule time for the word of God to fill your mind and to think about things. I believe that God wants you to meditate on things. Let's, let's look at some other things. What he says, Philippians chapter four. All right, Philippians chapter 4. What does God say in Philippians chapter 4, verses 6, 7, and 8? God says, be anxious for nothing. Be anxious for nothing. But in all things through prayer, say that with me, prayer. Prayer. And supplication. supplication. 
with thanksgiving. Don't forget those three things. Some people think, well, I prayed once. Isn't that enough? Sometimes. Then there's other things that you're facing that praying one time ain't going to do it. You're going to have to continue in prayer. That's called supplication. Then there's the third level called thanksgiving. This is when you've prayed about it. You've had faith. You've believed. But now you need to excel to a place where you're not just praying for it and crying out to God, help me here in this situation. You actually start thanking God for it and you haven't seen it yet. Ain't even seen a, a, a clue of it coming into your life. Prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, he says, and what? He says, make your request known unto God, right? Do you think that when you're telling God something, that you're informing him is the first, that his the first, that's the first I've heard of it. Wow, Philip, thank you for telling me about that. If God was sitting there listening to your prayer, he's not sitting there thinking, well, that's the first I've heard of this. I appreciate you bringing me that information and that news. No, God already knew it. Sometimes we think, well, why pray? God already knows. Because many times there's something that you discover in prayer. That's why I said many times you have to be quiet in prayer. But this, if you want to call it magical thing, I don't know if that's really the right word in English. I'll call it a miraculous thing, rather. This miraculous thing happens. The Bible says, let your request be made known unto God and the peace of God, which surpasses understanding will guard your heart and minds through Christ Jesus. And he says, finally, brethren, think on these things, things that are just, things that are lovely, things that are pure, things that are of a good report. If there be any virtue, if there be any praise, think on these things. I'm talking to you about peace. I need the right people in my life. I need to have peace in my life, peace in my heart and peace in my mind. From this point forward in my life, these are why why am I dragging around things that are not needful, people that are not needful, atmospheres that are not needful, mindsets that are not needful? Do you really want to spend the rest of your days stressed out, worried, fearful, afraid, anxious about everything when the Bible says to be anxious for nothing? Not me. I believe that life was to be in, is to be enjoyed, not endured. I don't. I have no no interest on just making it through. No interest in just getting by. That's a poverty mindset. If you have a mindset that you just want to get through the week, I can't wait till Friday gets here. You have a poverty mindset. That has nothing to do with money. That has everything to do with your perspective. The third thing that I have listed is prosperity. You can write that down. For all my great spellers, that's P-R-O-S-P-E-R-I-T-Y. Prosperity. I need prosperity. I sure don't need poverty. There's no holy merit in poverty. The church had thought that way for so many centuries. You know, keep them poor, keep them holy. There was nothing about poverty that made me holy. Poverty made me angry, frustrated, irritated, agitated. I found that many of the things that I was dreaming to do, I couldn't do because of poverty. So I need prosperity. Look at what God just told them in Isaiah 48. What did he tell him in verse 17? I will teach you to profit. Think about that. What does it mean to have a profit? Philip, you're a business owner. Let me ask you, what does it mean to to, to, to profit. It means I made money. I have a 
gain on what I put out. He said, I have a gain. Aren't, isn't everyone in business for profit? Mm, should be. I mean, nobody gets up and, and go, nobody here that has a job, you're, you're not a full-time volunteer, are you? Right? You're looking to profit. God said, I will teach you to profit. Think about that. My conversation with him concerning that is, if you're the teacher, then let me be the student and let me listen to what you have to say about how to profit. I don't need a profit for that necessarily. I need for God to teach me to profit. What do I mean by all of that? This is a real simple thing when I'm talking about prosperity. I'm talking about success. Every person needs success. Everybody. Everybody that listens to me on Facebook or you listen to me. However, every person needs to experience success in life. I wrote this the other day. Success is necessary for everyone to experience Life comes with ups and downs. The downs can be very low. The ups are not automatic. This is what I've learned about life. Life comes with ups and downs. Downs are very low. Ups are not automatic. If you think many times, this is a low place in my life. This may be one of the lowest places that I've ever been. If you think, well, things will change. Do you know how things change? They change by your decisions. They change by your perspective. They change by your thinking. They change by your mind. They change by the people you, you are interactive with. They change whether you are holding the peace of God. I have had the peace of God change everything for me in a moment, in an instant. All hell can be breaking loose. The world can look like it's going to hell in a handbasket and my checkbook going with it. And all of a sudden, I have a truth moment where truth rises up in me. That truth is only based on the word of God. Anybody who doesn't believe in truth, first of all, doesn't have the word of God because it is the truth. When that truth rises up inside of me, <coughs> you can say to me, you know, I don't really enjoy reading the Bible. Well, I would say to you, I don't either. But you know what I do enjoy? I enjoy living by the truth. And I had to make a determination. If I'm going to obtain present truth, it's going to have to come from here, not my present circumstance. The present truth changes everything for me. It changes my peace. It changes my relationships. Why? Because the Bible tells me who to be in relationships with. Who not to be in a relationship with. It gives you all the keys, the clues. So I'm on number three here. Prosperity. Prosperity. Here you go, Will. Here's your sheet. Prosperity. Success. That's what I'm talking about. I'm talking about victories. I'm talking about increase. Everybody needs to experience a victory in life. Somebody walks in and says, What's up, losers? I'm like you're in the wrong house. I'm going down to the one down the street. You'll find plenty. Of losers down there at that one. <laughs> As for me in my house, we'll serve the Lord. Everybody needs to experience a victory. Everybody needs to experience a success. Does anybody remember 
a couple of weeks ago what I told you about successes. That successes do not happen because of your dreams or your desires. How do they happen? Exactly. You can have all the desire to succeed. You can have the biggest dream to succeed in life. Whatever you call success. But until you get the right habits, you will not experience those successes. Every success that you have pictured in your mind first happens through a set of habits that you have to develop. Because the only reason that you are not where you want to be is because you have not developed the right habits to get there. Sometimes that happens because you haven't met the right person. I've had people that cause me to change my habits, change my schedule, change what I was doing. The difference between you and the future that you want to experience is change. You're not ready for what you want because you haven't changed into what you want to be. You can change. People say, oh, you know, I, I just can't change. You know, I'm like an old dog. You can't teach me any new tricks. What a sad perspective of my life. I don't believe that at all. I believe that's a cop out. I believe that's an excuse. If we're not able to change, God, I need you to change me. Most of the time, the response that I've gotten from him is, no, you change it. Right. And you let me deal with what you can't change. You change it. That's like me, you know, asking somebody to pray for me. Pray for me. Put your hand, oil me up and lay hands on me that I'll lose 50 pounds. But I'm going to keep eating the way that I eat and keep doing what I'm doing and sitting around like a couch potato. But I'm expecting a miracle to happen and I'm not willing to change. Many of the miracle, the miracle has been in the change. Me changing. That's part of me prospering in life. Developing right habits. Fourth thing is purity. P-U-R-I-T-Y. You may say Purity. Let me explain what I mean by that. These are the things that I've determined that are needful for the rest of my journey here on earth. I need right people. I need a right perspective. I need peace. That's where it comes from. I need prosperity. I need purity. What does Todd mean by that? Todd means right motives. I need right motives. This is something I'm constantly having a conversation with God about. Is what am I motivated by? Am I motivated to prosper just so that I can heap up a bunch of stuff and then one day, you know, leave it all behind? Seems kind of, uh, kind of worthless if you ask me. What does it profit a man to gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Now that's not a, a cop out to live in poverty. A lot of Christian people have the, uh, the, the bad habit of uh, interpreting that as, well, you know, I haven't prospered because God said it wasn't worth anything anyway. Why would he spend so much time talking to me about prospering in the earth if it wasn't needful? Right motives, having a right heart, right thinking. I'm talking to you about righteousness. Look at what he said in Isaiah. I'm still in Isaiah 48. I'm at verse 18. He said, Oh, that you had hearkened to my commandments, then had your peace been as a river and your righteousness as the waves of the sea. It's important that you have right motives, right heart, right thinking. It's important for you to be right with yourself. 
A lot of times people are not right with themselves. You may not like yourself. You may be sitting here listening to me and may think, you know, I really don't like myself. I used to be one of those people. Before I was a believer in Christ, I encountered a lot of Christian people and they knew I wasn't right with God. It wasn't hard to figure out. It was pretty evident. But most of the people that I encountered, they couldn't get past that I wasn't right with God. And I believe that one of the reasons I wasn't right with God is because I wasn't right with myself. How can I believe that God loved me so much, but yet I hated me so much? Are you hearing what I'm saying? I dislike myself. I didn't like the way I did things. You know, I would wake up every day and I would say, I'm not going to smoke today. Within an hour, I'd be at the convenience store getting a pack of camels, smoking it, and by lunchtime, I was probably had another pack. I would say, I'm not going to drink today. But yet, I would drink a beer for breakfast and eat a honey bun. Every day. There were things that I didn't like about myself. I didn't like me. They would tell me, well, you know, if you just cut your hair and come to church with me, then, uh, you know, they would be happy with me. Other people's happiness with me did not determine whether I was happy with me. You could have liked me. You could have loved me. You could have hated me. It wouldn't have changed my perspective of me. I needed to be right with myself. Part of righteousness is being right with yourself. Part of righteousness is being right with other people. This is part of purity. You will do things and say things when you're not right with yourself. You will act out toward other people. You ever encounter people that are just having a bad day every day? Did you know that it's not about you when they interact with you? It's about them. It took me a long time to discover that. Grumpy people, irritated people. I'm talking about people that are just mean all the time. <laughs> Don't take it personal. Did you know it doesn't have anything to do with you? I used to I used to be a manager and supervisors in places, and I, I had some grumpy people, some grumpy employees. And people would come to me and they'd say, what's wrong with that dude? Why doesn't he like me? It has nothing to do with you. He wakes up on the wrong side of the bed every day. You know why? Because he's not right within himself. More than likely it has something to do with him not being right with God. We have peace with God now through our Lord Jesus Christ. Purity. I want to do things right because it's right and I want to do it right every time. And there's nothing wrong with that. There's nothing wrong with that. Don't let ever, anyone ever convince you of going along with something that's wrong. <coughs> let me say that stronger. Don't ever let anyone convince you of going along with something that you feel is wrong. Because later you will wind up regretting it. Yeah. Old timers used to say, go with your first mind on something. You ever thought, this is what I need to do, and somebody else comes and says something, and you change your mind about it, and you go along, and then later you're like, good God, I wish I would have never done that now. I knew what was right. Number five is a positive outlook. Positive outlook. You need a positive outlook, not a negative one. That's why I try to stay away, right, away from critical people and you know people that's always trying to find everything wrong with everybody and everything in every situation. Please, if you watch the news long enough, you are not going to have a positive outlook about life. Amen. Turn it off. I don't care whether it's Fox, CNN, MSNBC, CNN, you know the Communist News Network or whoever they are. You're not going to get a positive outlook on life. You will not encounter one hour of news and walk away and feel like the world is a positive place. It's going to be about who got robbed and who got shot and who got 
this and that. it's going to be constant. Yes, the world is filled with evil people. I'm not asking you to bury your head in the sand and try to act like that it doesn't exist. The world is a corrupt place. But that doesn't mean you have to be corrupt. Amen. You know, some people say, well, you know, when you're in Rome, just do like the Romans. No, I'm not a chameleon. I don't change with the culture. I don't change with the tides. I don't, because I get around somebody politically correct doesn't mean that I become politically correct. I don't go along with other people's persuasions because that's the way they're persuaded. I only go along with what I know as the truth. Are you hearing me? Just because a family member or whoever has a differing opinion about life doesn't mean that I go along with them so that I can get along with them. Boy, this is getting good. I'm going to have to go back and watch the video now. I said, just because they have a differing opinion doesn't mean that I go along with them to get along with them. I'm trying to tell you there's going to be people that you're not going to get along with, and this is a key and a clue to who you don't need to be around. This is a key and a clue to right people and wrong people. Now, if they're satisfied to be around me, and I'm not saying that I, that you need to be just a person that's you know always sharing your opinion. I tell my sons all the time about their granddaddy that they never met, quietest man I've ever known in my life. Never said a word, very rarely. But I can remember when he spoke. And when he spoke up, the whole family fell into a holy hush. Papa speaking. It must be important. It didn't matter who you was having a conversation with. When this man spoke, he was like E.F. Hutton. Everybody listen. Because he didn't talk in foolishness or open his mouth unless he had something to say. So when he spoke, everybody was like, it wasn't just a wow moment. It was like, I better tune in here because this is probably going to be some important information for my life. I'm talking about having a positive outlook here. What do I mean by that? That I'm looking forward in faith. I'm looking forward in faith. There's nothing about my faith that's telling me that life is going to get worse from this point. Faith is not telling me that. Faith has never told me it's only, it's only going downhill from here, Todd. I'm fixed to turn 50, and any of y'all tell me, you know, you over the hill or it's all downhill from here, I'm going to tell you, you a liar. And the devil is one too. Because it's all going, I'm getting better. I'm getting better. I'm not getting bitter. People who are not enjoying their experience and their journey through life are the people who are getting bitter. I'm talking about your journey through life here. These are seven important things that I found that are important to my journey from here forward. Everything else, I'm getting rid, I'm simplifying, I'm getting rid of everything that's not needful from this point forward. This is what's needful. I, I must have a positive outlook. I've got to have an outlook of faith as I go forward. I don't believe that I can move forward without faith. Chauncey, I don't believe that I can move forward without faith. I hear people say, you know, it's two steps forward and one step back. That's not what my faith tells me. I'm just going to keep moving forward. I'm going to keep progressing. I'm going to keep getting better. Life's going to keep getting sweeter. It's going to, it's going to be so good. I, I don't even know if I'm going to be able to stand it. If you think that I'm good now, wait until later. If you th look at my life and think, wow, he's got a good life, just wait till later. It's going to be even better. You're not going to be able to stand it, much less me. Isn't that the type of people you want to be around? Yeah. I can't stand being around people that's, it's, 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 the, it's the worst thing ever. And it's always something and a problem. I'm like, no wonder your problems keep getting bigger because that's all you focus on. That's all you talk about. Did you know talking about a problem doesn't fix it? Right. Fix the darn problem and move on. It's like a hypochondriac, you know, that, if you've got an illness, well, they've had it three times and, and three times over worse than you've ever had. 
I mean, if you got a headache, honey, I've had one for seven years. I'm like, yeah, I bet you gave your mom and daddy a headache too. Your mama probably, you were probably born with your mama having a headache. It's all there. Plans, that's number, <laughs> number six. <laughs> number six is plans. Plans. Yes, indeed. Number, he had number five, I need a positive outlook. Correct. Number six is plans. Plans is a decision. I said plans are a decision. I make my plans. I plan my day. I plan my week. I plan my year. I set my goals. I'm the one determining my dreams. That doesn't mean that God can't give you a dream. But some people, God's been trying to give them a dream, but they're not listening. There's nothing wrong with having a dream. But sometimes you've got to get your head out of the clouds. Sometimes you've got to get your perspective off of next year and get it on today. I do make plans. Every day I have plans. I need a bigger day planner. My plan, day planner doesn't have enough lines for all of my plans in the day. God, I need a couple more hours in the day to fulfill my plans. But you know what? He's not going to give me 26 hours in a day. Everybody in this room has the same 24 hours. But you determine what you do with those hours. You're the decision maker. You know, people say, well, you know, God's my pilot and I'm the co-pilot. Ah. You're piloting this thing. What did he say in Psalm 32 and 8? God said, I will teach you and instruct you in the way you should go. Sounds kind of like what we just read in Isaiah 48, 17. I will teach you and instruct you in the way that you should go. I will guide you with my eye. I will teach you. God, I need to be taught. I will instruct you. Then I need some instructions. I need some instructions on planning. What do I need to plan here? What is a plan? Here's my definition of it. I wrote it down. A working perspective of expectation. A working perspective of expectation. This is what I'm expecting to do, and this is when I'm expecting to do it by. A working perspective of expectation. Plans take faith. You know, when we built this house, we didn't just say to the contractor, hey, we want a house. Okay. Where's your plans? Well, I ain't got any. I just want a house. What do you think I would have wound up with? Tiny home. <laughs> Whatever he wanted, right? I reckon <laughs> he would have been the one determining it. No, April and I sat down, went through house plans, and we found the plans we want, and we handed him the plans. This is how we want it. This is how we want it to look. And it turned out looking exactly like the plan. If you want something to look a certain way, start planning for it. Right. I hear people, you know, in their 30s or 40s, they'll start, they'll start using this word, retirement. There's nothing wrong with that. Then start planning for it. Start thinking about when, when you... One day, are no longer going to get up and go to work and you're going to be bored out of your mind. <laughs> what do you want it to look like? You want to just be bored out of your mind? Do you want to be a useless person that's, you know, waiting on the grass to grow so you can get on the lawn more? Or what? I don't know. 
I don't have those kind of plans. I don't plan on retiring. That sounds kind of boring to me. I like what I do. Most times people that are trying to get out of what they do is because they don't like what they do. If you don't like what you do, change it now. I used to work with people. They'd come to work and they would say, I hate this job. You know what I would tell them? Please leave then. We would all be happier. Because you're unhappy and your unhappiness is trying to make us unhappy. And I'm not going to be unhappy with you, so please leave. Go somewhere else. Find what you want to do and go do it. Life's too short for you not to. Amen. Start planning your exit. Here, I'll help you. I'll get you a piece of pen and paper. We will plan your exit. And they would say, well, you know, you know, do you know people that I used to work with thought I was insane? Because this is how I talked to them. And they said, well, well, you're here for the same reason I'm here, for a paycheck. And I said, oh, no, that's where you just went wrong. I can find a paycheck in a whole lot of places. I'm only here because I want to be here. And whenever that changes, I will change. Make your plans. Make your plans. Today, consider your plans. That's number six. This is important for me. That's important. This is needful for me. I have to make plans from here forward. Plan your success. Where are you wanting to succeed? Start planning it. You may somebody tell, sit here and tell me, well, I don't know the steps to it. Well, you've got to start thinking. Think. Think. Thinking is what separates people. Did you know that? Thinking is what separates people. It's the difference in people is how they think. How they think usually determines on who they know or who they're listening to. If you've got, if you have thinking that tells you that you're going to be broke and poor all of your life, then you've probably either come up with that yourself, you either listen to the devil, or you've been listening to wrong people. Because I haven't found this in my Bible yet, right? And I haven't found this in people that know the Bible and talk about the Bible and know the truth of the Bible. And I'm not talking about people, there are people that read this Bible and they get confused. Because they read one scripture and don't read the rest of them. And they're always trying to find what's wrong with you and the world and everything else. I'm not looking for that. Stay away from those people. That was, that's, that was number one. People. Do you know that most people's problems are people? Other people. Every time that I have... Most every time I have encountered someone that came to me with a problem, they always start talking about a person. I'm not saying that people don't have health problems. Okay, they do. But most people's problems stem from other people. If you've got problem people in your life, get rid of the problem people and the problem goes away. It's that simple, right? Shoo. You don't have to answer. Did you know that? You don't have to answer. I've told people, they're like, well, you didn't, you didn't take my call. I had to explain to them, my phone, I pay for it. Not you. I pay for it. You know why I pay for it? I pay for it for my convenience, not yours. It's not your hello line to me. Every time that you want to share your opinion about me or my family or anybody else for you to have a hotline to my ear. I don't have to respond to the text. I don't have to respond to a private message or somebody messages you on Instagram or, or you don't have to respond. Did you know that some people are trying to, to drag you into a conversation just to get your day messed up. Some people want you to have a bad day because they're having a bad life. I'm trying to give you all some good pointers here on things. I hope you're getting them. I'm still on plans, all right? Last thing I'll tell you about that is God has plans. 
God said in Jeremiah 29, 11, I know the plans that I have for you, says the Lord. They're plans of peace, prosperity, the future, and an expected end. I love that last one, an expected end, an end that I can expect. I'm not going down here. I'm going out with a bang. Boom. It's, going to, it's just going to blow up a lot. It's going to get better. An expected end. I'm not talking about that this is going to be a thriller or a mystery like when you're reading a book and you, I can't, can't wait to get to the end. It's going to be good all the way through, all the way till the end. And I can expect what's going to happen at the end. What's it going to be? Fantastic. Good. Better. Great. That's what I'm expecting. Last one I got on your list should be praise. Praise. Now, when you use this word, most people think, oh, he's talking about God. Yes, I am. You do need to give God praise. But I don't stop or fall short there. Because I've seen people that they praising God, but they criticizing everybody else. Oh, give thanks unto the Lord, for he is good. We read it all this morning. For his mercy endures forever. Oh, give thanks unto the Lord, for he is good, for his mercy endures forever. The Bible teaches us over and over and over about giving God praise, giving God thanksgiving, God, giving him adoration. Why? Well, he's worthy. Two, I found something else about it, is when you get your mind off of you and what you're going through and your circumstance and your hardship, you know, he, he chooses you in the furnace of affliction. The reason that they, they Isaiah is using this is because when they would make pottery, they put it in a fire and they don't take it out until the pottery starts singing. That's how they know when to take it out. God says, I, I choose you in the furnace of affliction. You ever notice Jacob has two wives, Rachel and Leah. He loves one, but doesn't love the other, right? Leah has, you know, she has the first son and then the second son and the third son. And they were all about Jacob and how, well, my husband will love me now or my husband will be attached to me now. But then when she gets to number four, she says, you know what? I'm going to just call him Judah. I'm just going to praise. Sometimes we're trying to extract something from somebody else or trying to get something from somebody else and you just need to let it go. Mm -hmm. You just need to let it go and just start praising God. And things will change for you because your perspective changes. When you start praising, your perspective changes. What are you doing when you're praising? You're expressing appreciation. This, herein lies most of the problems is people are either taking for granted what they have or they're complaining about what they have and things never change for them. All you got to do is read the book of Exodus, then go on into Leviticus and, and Numbers and you'll see why they stayed where they were and nothing ever changes because they grumbled and they murmured and they complained. I need praise for my journey. It's going to produce a whole lot of things for me. Sometimes you don't feel like praising. It's thanksgiving. It's gratitude. It's compliments. Find that with other people. Find it with the people that are, you're around. I talked to you about that last week. Find, find the people around you and their strengths. Point them out. Compliment them. I love the way you do that. I love the way you say that. Praise 
Don't just praise God, praise people. Because it becomes a lot of hypocrisy if we're praising God and backbiting people. I got an eighth line on there, but this one's not your decision. It's your purpose. That was just your discovery. All the other ones are about decisions. Those are all decisions you make. Your purpose is not your decision. It's your discovery. So that one, it's important to your life's journey, but God already determined it. Aren't you glad? Aren't you glad that you don't have to decide your purpose here? You know, my purpose would have been mess. Because <laughs> I was going to make a mess wherever I went. Mess with people. Oh yeah, I, I like to mess with people and I created a mess in other people's life. But God already decided that for me. He made that part easy for me. I'm not saying the other ones can't be easy, but you just have to make a decision. So I want you to think about, in light of me closing this today, I'm looking at Isaiah 48, 17 again, one more time. He says, thus says the Lord, your Redeemer. He's your Redeemer. The Holy One of Israel, I am the Lord your God, which teaches, 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 teaches you to profit. God teaches you to profit and leads you in the way that you should go. Three thoughts that are on your sheet while I'm closing this. Simplifying your life into needful a needful perspective is healthy. This is why. There's are three reasons for choosing seven things here. The first one, it develops and enhances my focus. As I've chose what I need from here forward, it's enhancing my focus. It's sharpening me. The second thing, it's causing me to use my time effectively and wisely. Teach us to number our days, Lord, that we may apply our hearts unto wisdom. Stop wasting time. Right. Stop wasting time with wrong people. Stop wasting time being worried. The only thing that I've ever seen worry accomplish is waste your time. You wasted a whole lot of time being worried about nothing. And the third thing, when you define your objectives in life, you go from thriving or from surviving to thriving. Amen. I have no interest in surviving. No interest. I am not planning on arriving in heaven and thinking, I made it. I survived. I got by. Now, I'm sure there's going to be all kind of, in, you know, joy. But do you know what the Bible says? That we're already inheritors of those things. That means in the now. I'm not waiting to get to heaven to begin to receive my inheritance. I'm receiving it now. It's going to be a big shock for a lot of people to go from this earth to into his kingdom because they've lived their whole life in an earth perspective. How much easier is it when you go from surviving to thriving? That's what this is all about. When you're choosing the right people, when you make a decision that I'm going to live in peace, when you decide I'm going to have a positive outlook. When you decide I'm going to praise my way all the way through this situation, 
All of those are decisions that you're making. When you decide, I just need to have pure motives here. Did you know that you can be at peace with people that are not at peace with you? I said, you can be at peace. Somebody needs to hear this. I don't know who it is. You can be at peace with people who are not at peace with you. You can be right with people who are not right with you. There are people in this world, they don't like you. There may be people that they can't stand you. But you don't have to shudder at that and lose your peace about it. Don't lay in the bed at night worrying about how how am I how can I change their mind about me? Sorry. They're responsible for their mind, not me to change their mind. Right. They'll have to change their own mind. I'm going to be who I am by the grace of God and do what I do and live how I live and be convinced about what I'm convinced about and determine what I've determined so far and that's how, that's how I'm going to go. And if anybody doesn't like that, then they'll have to find their own way. Whether I'm related to them or not. Amen. Just because I'm related to somebody does not mean I have to be joined at the hip. There are too many people in this world that they are allowing relatives to manipulate them even emotionally yep. just because they're related to them. Sorry, that train stops here. I'm going to get ready to sign off today from here. Appreciate everybody that's been with me here on Facebook today. Hey, Joe. Let me just tell you all one thing and then I'm done. Whenever you are in a lack of peace, just do a quick check. Am I out of harmony with myself? Am I out of harmony with God? Or am I out of harmony with somebody else? Now, I'm not talking about somebody's manipulations because some people are trying to manipulate other people to get them to do what they want them to do to control people. People, there, I learned this recently and that wasn't on my own. There's two types of people in the world, people that like freedom and people that like to control other people. Right. I like freedom. I do not care to control anybody. If I wanted to control people, I would become a politician. That's what politicians like to do. They are that type of people. They're not the people that like freedom. They like to control other people. Right. So don't expect them to be freedom loving people. They have a need inside of them to control other people because they want to control things of the world and how things go. I'm of the opposite. Let them choose. That's how God does. God lets people choose. That's why I ask God, why'd you put that tree in the garden? There wouldn't have been any sin. There wasn't a fruit for, for Adam and Eve. We would, we would, everything would have been all right. But then they wouldn't have been like God. They wouldn't have had the freedom to choose. You choose. Choose this day. You choose your freedom. If you're lacking peace inside, then do a self-check. Is there, is there something that with myself? Is there something with God here? Or is there something with another person where I need to... Don't let people control you. Don't let people manipulate you. Don't, people, don't let people emotionally manipulate you. It's not needful for your journey. You'll wind up regretting it later. Thank y'all. I'm signing off. Hey, Janie, I will see you.
next Sunday right here on Dr. Todd's page. You can go to our website, Wisdom for Beyond. That's F-O-R, wisdomforbeyond.com. If you want to sow a seed, it's right on the home page. You just click sow a seed. It'll take you to a PayPal link, and you can sow a seed. We love you. I'm going to pray with my household of faith. Thank you, Miss Rollins. I appreciate you. Thank you, Jingo. He has put many notes in the chat stream. Appreciate you as well. Everybody else that was with me today. I'll see you next Sunday. Bye-bye.